Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about CoQ10. Two thirds of Americans take some sort of vitamin or mineral or herbal supplement with the number increasing to more than three out of every four individuals over age 55 with the most popular being fish oil or multivitamins or vitamin D and then number four is CoQ10 sales each year about 200 million dollars and it's growing every year for the past 15 years at a rate of about 20 percent it's estimated that there are currently 16 million users of CoQ10 and that's up from 500,000 just in 2007. People make purchases online through the internet or ads or health food stores or retail outlets or direct mail. There were 18 different brands in 2001. That has increased to over 120 at the current time. And you have to realize that even though it's packaged and sold as a brand name product, there are relatively few manufacturers of CoQ10, the basic product, that the supplement manufacturers buy. Actually, most of the manufacturer of CoQ10 is from a Japanese corporation now with a subsidiary here in the United States. Other manufacturers are less reputable. They're perhaps from China and other areas where there's even less regulation. Supposedly, the product is all natural, uh, manufactured by yeast fermentation supposedly bioidentical to the, the human CoQ10 that we manufacture in our bodies every day. CoQ10 has been marketed for a phenomenal variety of different conditions. Supposedly, it will decrease your blood pressure, it will treat heart failure, it will treat other heart diseases, it will reduce your cholesterol, it will treat or prevent your cancer, muscular dystrophy, and get rid of Parkinson's disease. It will prevent muscle pain, especially muscle pain that you might get after taking the statins to reduce your cholesterol. It supposedly helps prevent or treat liver problems, slows Alzheimer's disease, prevent migraine headaches, and even can treat certain metabolic or genetic diseases. On the other hand, the Food and Drug Administration has not granted approval for any medical condition to manufacturers of CoQ10. It's frequently recommended by general practitioners and by some specialists, but it's important to realize that it's not formally reviewed by the Food and Drug Administration. There is no study on the safety, no study on the effectiveness, and no study that it's even consistent from one brand to another or one batch to another. The FDA doesn't allow the manufacturers to promote their products to either treat or prevent any disease, but the manufacturers push the line all the time. It's important also to realize that the manufacturers have not presented any investigational new drug application to the Food and Drug Administration to study the product for heart disease or for cancer. The names, well, it goes by the name of CoQ10, CoQ, Q10, vitamin Q10. Actually, the real name is ubidecarinone. It also goes by the name ubiquinone. Well, it was discovered in 1955, and shortly thereafter it was found that it actually moves electrons around inside the cell, so it seems to be important in certain mitochondrial diseases that were discovered in the 1970s. Actually, the chemistry behind the CoQ10 and the electron chain that was given a Nobel Prize in 1978. The chemical is found in membranes throughout the body, the highest concentration, or in areas where there's the highest energy requirement, like the heart or the liver or the kidney or the pancreas, and lowest in the lungs, lowest levels in disease, in cancer, lowest levels in cancer of the prostate or the lung or pancreas or colon or kidney or head and neck area and myeloma or lymphoma. But it's not shown to be of treatment value in any of those diseases. They're just people have low levels. Well, it's important in moving the electrons around in the body. It can be important in regulating blood flow. It works as an antioxidant. It seems to be important in energy metabolism and in the immune system, your antibody levels, resistance to different diseases. It seems to keep the bone levels up, prevent osteoporosis, might even 
act like an anti-metabolite, a cancer-treating drug. That's all mm, taken with a grain of salt. A coenzyme is a substance that helps an enzyme work. The coenzyme is not a protein, but it does contain some carbon atoms, and the body uses it for a variety of different substances. Now, there are two basic forms of CoQ10. There's the ubiquinol and the ubiquinone. The ubiquinol is the reduced form. 95% of the measured CoQ10 from the bloodstream is the ubiquinol. If we look at the tissue itself, only about 60 to 95 percent is the ubiquinol. And if we look specifically at either the brains or the lungs, it's less than 25 percent in this form. This is the form that's best absorbed by the gastrointestinal system. The ubiquinone, that's the fully oxidized form. And the body changes that back into the ubiquinol. There are several other kind of intermediate forms that are apparently less important. Now, the body can manufacture CoQ10. And in fact, in younger people, that's the principal source. In older individuals, it comes mostly from dietary means, because at age 21, that's the peak level of production by the body, and the body's production level decreases by about two-thirds by the time you get to age 65. Now, the amount of chemical produced seems to be less in people with diabetes or people with cancer, people with heart disease. That's not necessarily to say that the decreased level is the cause of any of those conditions. The decreased level might be due to decreased production or increased requirements or maybe even insufficient intake of some of the precursors. Well, we know that the CoQ10 seems to require the function of at least 12 different genes. An abnormality in any one of those genes might decrease the amount of CoQ10 that your body is going to produce. CoQ10 is a combination of two different kind of chemicals. One is what we call a benzoquinone. And the benzoquinone is manufactured by certain kind of chemicals that we take in in our diet tyrosine, that's an amino acid, and also, interestingly, phenylalanine, which, among other things, is the chemical in NutraSweet, or aspartame. It also is manufactured. The second component is isoprene. And isoprene is involved in the cholesterol manufacturing pathway. It requires mevalonic acid in order to produce this. Now, if you take a statin, if you take one of the drugs to reduce your cholesterol, like Lipitor or Crestor or Zocor Simvastatin, that's theoretically going to reduce the amount of the isoprene. The isoprene is what gets it into the cell. The benzoquinone is what moves the electrons around inside the cell. That's the important active component. Now, you can get some in the food, but the amount in food is less than the amount you would get in your supplement. But if you're going to take it as a supplement, you've got to be careful. You can't take vitamin E at the same time because that's going to decrease the amount of CoQ10 that gets into the system. And it gets into the system best when you take it with a fatty meal. It's a fat-soluble material. If you look at the food, it seems to be best in cold water fish. The highest levels are in cold water fish, for instance, in tuna or salmon. Salmon, always on the top list of healthy foods. There's less of it in meat. For instance, it's more in the chicken thigh than the chicken breast. Sometimes it's in organ meats, like the liver or the heart. It's in whole grains or certain oils like canola or olive oil more so than other oils. And it's in avocado and broccoli and cauliflower. Again, more than other vegetables. If you fry foods, you're going to decrease the concentration of CoQ10 by about a third. Now, if we look at the individual components of where it's supposed to be so helpful, if we look at the heart, well, it's going to theoretically decrease the amount of oxidized LDL in the tissue in the heart, and that's toxic supposedly. But if we look at what the function is, we can't find that it decreases your blood pressure, doesn't decrease your heart rate, doesn't decrease the amount of LDL, doesn't decrease the amount of triglycerides, and doesn't change any electrocardiographic measure. Now, there was a study in 2014 called the Q-Symbio study. 
and it supposedly showed that CoQ10 was helpful, but the study was terribly done. They tried to get 550 patients, and after eight years, they could only get 420 patients. They studied them for two years, and they did indeed find that there was a decrease in the cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality, but the real reason was probably the diuretic that the people were taking. So overall, no clear benefit as far as the cardiovascular system is concerned. Certainly doesn't help the LDL, certainly doesn't help the cholesterol. How about the muscles? Well, does it prevent statin-induced muscle problems? A study was done in 2015. It was done by the Cochrane Collaboration without any input from the drug industry. And basically, they found the material to be of no benefit. Well, is a statin drug associated with muscle pain? People go back and forth on that. Yes, indeed it is, but to some extent. There's a significant variation between the medical studies, mostly done by the drug companies, and the clinical complaints that people have. Well, is it good for periodontal disease? People say that, hey, it's good for your gums. Again, no benefit has been determined. People say it's good to prevent cancer or to treat cancer. First interest was in 1961 when it was found that there were low levels in cancer patients. But in cancer patients, women with breast cancer, who were given supplements of CoQ10, there was no change in fatigue, no change in quality of life, no change in the outcome. Well, so for cancer we don't have any good data. How about diabetes? No change in the blood sugar, no improvement in the triglycerides, no improvement in the lipids. How about neurologic disease? What about that Parkinson's disease or Huntington's, Korea Huntington's disease? The NIH did a study, no benefit. How about migraine headaches? Very low quality evidence according to the Canadian Headache Society. How about infertility? Can it improve the birth rate? Nope, doesn't do that. Does it really significantly improve your immune status? Does it in the laboratory? Does it do it in people? No, no evidence. And there's no consensus even on the dose. It seems like the amount that of CQ varies in the different kind of organs. So depending on whether we're talking about the heart or the lung or the kidneys, all have different levels. If we measure it in the bloodstream, we find a significant variation but it's mostly present in the tissues. So in order to find out how much CoQ10 you have, we'd actually have to biopsy the heart, biopsy the muscle. Well, the established dose, there isn't any. People take as little as 50 milligrams or as much as 1,200 milligrams on a daily basis. The typical dose is somewhere between 100 milligrams and 300 milligrams taken as one dose or in divided doses. If you take more than 2,400 milligrams, you're going to have a decrease in the absorption of the material. Most of the studies that showed some benefit, or many of the studies at least showed benefit, were performed in Tehran or in Moscow. The studies were performed on the basis that CoQ10 was going to be helpful. Now, if you look at the absorption of CoQ10, there's going to be significant variation depending on the way it's taken. If it's taken in powder form, well, unfortunately, remember, it's fat-soluble. So you have to put it maybe in a gel with some oil. And better yet, maybe uh, take it with some polymers or cyclodextrins or something like that. Do that, you might get a higher level in the blood. Not that it makes any difference, apparently. The peak concentration is going to be two to six hours after you take the product, and then you're going to have another peak about 24 hours later because there's what we call an enterohepatic circulation. You excrete it out in the intestine, and then your body reabsorbs it. The half-life is pretty long. It's about 36 hours. It's going to be eliminated through the bile. CoQ levels are going to change depending on some kind of medicines that you might take, side effects, well, they're very mild, they're not usual sometimes. They could get a little diarrhea or heartburn or nausea or indigestion, something of that nature. It might impact on the way warfarin works to decrease its effect, so you've got to be a little careful. And also careful if you're taking insulin or if you're taking thyroid supplements. It's not recommended for pregnant women or breastfeeding women, not because of any specific harm that we know of, but just because we don't know what's in the product. 
even though the product says it has CoQ10 in it, it could have a variety of other substances as well, because remember, they're not regulated by the FDA. Well, in a study, it was found that on average, the amount of CoQ10 in the material you take is about three quarters of what it says on the label. The cost of CoQ10 per 100 milligrams ranges anywhere between seven cents and two dollars and sixty-five cents. So what's the bottom line? Should you go out and take CoQ10? No, there's no concrete evidence that it's going to be of any benefit to you. There are a lot of people out there, a lot of companies out there, a lot of ads out there that are promoting the material, but the question is, do we have any medical evidence that it's going to help you? Is there any evidence that it's going to be beneficial? Unfortunately, the answer is absolutely no, there is no good evidence. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.